Uh, please join with me uh, in turning back to <clears throat> 1 Samuel uh, chapter 5. Uh, we are skimming through uh, 5, 6 and dipping into the start of chapter 7 this morning. Um, and uh, there's a good portion of things to, for us to consider and a number of helpful uh, principles for us to pay attention to this morning. If you are listening and hopefully joining fully in your hearts with prayer, in prayer with Adam a moment ago, uh, you will have a, a bit of an indication as to where we're going uh, as well. Uh, just to help give uh, a little bit of historical, geographical context uh, to where we are looking uh, this morning. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, the people of the Philistines uh, with uh, Ashdod and Gath and Ekron being mentioned here. Uh, well, here's a, a little map just to give you a bit of a helpful impression if you can see that. Uh, so uh, Gath is the, the Philistine city mentioned here and Ashdod is just would have been city, situated just about there. Ekron uh, was a little bit further north and uh, then you can see that the general direction that the ark ends up travelling is going from about Gath heading up this way and then if you look into the square which is the, that area magnified you can see uh, Kiriath Jerim up there which is eventually where the ark ends up. This is the region in which the ark is, be, is moving around. Now if you look a little bit further up there you can see Shiloh uh, that is where the tabernacle had been. That is where the Ark of the Covenant had been stored. And all the worship of God had been focused there in this place. Uh, we do learn uh, in Jeremiah uh, that Shiloh is destroyed. And the general idea is, uh, from reading a couple of commentaries, uh, that, the, that Shiloh was probably destroyed around about the same time that the Philistines captured the Ark as well. Uh, that seems to be at least a general impression, uh, which is part of the reason, I think, why we get to the end of the chapter, or the end of the passage this morning, we see that the Ark doesn't return there, uh, because Shiloh simply at that point didn't exist seemingly any longer. But that just, hopefully you can have that in mind, this is where the area that we're talking about. Uh, but you should be able to remember uh, from last week, uh, we found that the Israelites, uh, they went out to go and fight the Philistines. They were doing something that God had commanded them to, to protect their land, to expand it. Uh, they lost. They thought, well, in order to win, uh, let's grab God. We will assure our victory. Uh, they still lost, and even worse, they lost the Ark of the Covenant, and everything looked like it had gone wrong. It appeared for the people of Israel like God had left them. And what we have recorded in these uh, two chapters here, though they are very challenging for us to read and to see the way that God works, what God is doing is he's teaching the Philistines who he is. He's showing them that he is the power behind the people of Israel. And the very fact that these events have been recorded in scripture meant that they became known amongst the people of Israel, meant that they were also there to teach the people of Israel about God, to remind them who they should be serving. This is a time in Israel when there is this seven month period of loss and sadness because they fear that God has gone. Fear that God has been, allowed them to be defeated, that his power is not really there with them. And is this little episode here, does this reset their love for God? That's really the question, isn't it? That's really what the purpose of God's actions are, is to, to reset their understanding of him so that then they know exactly how they should approach him and how they should deal with him. And those are things that we need to remind ourselves of again too, even as God's people uh, this morning. And so our first heading uh, to help us uh, think through this passage is that God is God. God is God. Um, it's always fascinating, isn't it, when you have... Uh, two people who are really big characters and you see them meeting together. Uh, there's always this slight like question, who's going to come out on top? Is one of them going to have to bow and give way or, or are they both just going to be at loggerheads completely uh, and there's going to be no progress, it's just going to be a major bust up, uh, arguments are going to ensue and, they're gonna, and, and trouble uh, is only going to follow. It's a bit like I guess if you're uh, watched in the past uh, the TV show The Apprentice 
Uh, you have, don't you, all these candidates who are, who are full of bravado. They, they, have, they are these great big characters, and some of them have been really tempestuous. And then they go into the boardroom, and they're there face to face with Alan Sugar, who himself is not known for being the mildest of characters. Uh, and you kind of go, well, who's going to win out? And they sometimes argue back against him, don't they? Uh, they sometimes cause some trouble. But eventually, I guess partly given the premise of the show, given uh, who he is and that it's his uh, money anyway that they're, that they're after, uh, he gets the final say. Well, there's something almost uh, picture-like of what it takes place here in the land of the Philistines. We're told, aren't we, in verse 2, that after they've captured the Ark of God, they take it into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. Uh, Dagon was one of the two uh, particularly chief Philistine gods. Uh, they had many, uh, but he was known as being the fa- one of the fathers of the gods. Uh, he was a god particularly of, of the harvest, but not just that, but of, of especially prosperity uh, within the land and they take God's Ark of the Covenant, uh, the very symbol of God's presence, and they place him right beside Dagon. Uh, This is is in some ways the Philistines continuing to show a respect and care and reverence for God. Uh, We saw that, didn't we, in chapter 4, verse 7, uh, when the Ark appears in the camp, the Philistines were afraid. They say, a God has come into the camp. They said, Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Uh, They knew that this was a real God. Uh, They knew that the God that the Israelites had had power and was capable of doing all kinds of things. They knew and had heard about God's work amongst the Egyptians. We read that again in chapter 4, verse 8. They say, they are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. They understand God. And so when they capture the ark... They don't say, well, let's just disregard it. Let's smash it to bits. They say, well, this is a God that we want on our side. This is a God that we're going to add to our collection. We've got got other gods anyway. Let's just add another God to it. They are superstitious uh, people. They don't make him uh, and belittle him, but they decide that they want to honour him and worship him and have him seen as alongside their God. And then we have this really comical scene, don't we? Uh, They go in the next morning and their God, Dagon, their statue, has fallen on his face on the ground before the Lord. And what do they do? They pick him back up. Here's a God, right? A God. And he needs help standing up from people. Uh, it's not told, we don't, we're not told that the, the statue of Dagon fell down. It, this is literally Dagon falls down. And, and Dagon, not the statue of Dagon, Dagon needs help standing up. Set him up. Leave him there. The next morning they go in again and he's fallen down again. But it's a worse picture, isn't it? Dagon isn't just fallen face down, but his head's been completely cut off, his hands have been taken off, and they are sat there on the threshold of the temple, and his body is entirely separate from him. This is a god who's lost his head, right? He, he, he actually, he's seen here, is not living. His hands are gone. He has no power. This is... God setting a picture before the people of Philistines of the worthlessness they have in following their God, Dagon. Before the true and the living God, every other God has to bow down, has to fall. And and as we see these people trying to prop up their statue, what are we reminded We're reminded that the gods that people create, the gods that we see in the world round about us, the gods and the idols of people's hearts, they are created by people. Uh, They're not real gods. They are just mere creations. They are gods that have an illusion of power and the power they possess is supplied by the people who worship them. That's why, isn't it, sometimes when... We, we, if we, you speak out 
against another religion's God, people get so uptight and so angry. Because it's not, that you're, it's not the fact that you're speaking out against their God, it's that you're speaking out against a God that they have shaped and fashioned. It is a God that they like, it is a God of their heart, it is a God that they have poured every part of their being into and crafted a belief that fits them and their intentions. The gods of this world are powered by their followers by the people who submit themselves freely to them. And when they come face to face with a real God, when they face to come face to face with a God who is actually living, who has actual power, they have to bow. They have to give. Do we remember what it was like uh, before you became a Christian? I know for some of us that may have been very, at a very young age. Do you remember when you used to love all kinds of different things within your own hearts, when there were all kinds of other gods or idols that you came after, but slowly, one by one, what does God do? He makes every single one of them fall. And you see them for their worthlessness and for their emptiness and for the lack of power that they actually have. Because when God is present, everything else, everyone else, has to give way. God is teaching the Philistines there is only one God and it's not yours. It's me. It was the presence of the one true God that the Israelites thought that they had and sought to make use of for their own benefit. They'd got that wrong, hadn't they? They did have it right. They did have the only God who could help them. They did have a true God. They did have a real God. They did have the God but they messed it up. What we need to remember is there's a really interesting verse, isn't there, well known to us in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul, speaking about the humility of the Lord Jesus, ends up by saying that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Why is that important? Because one day, our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be really seen for who he is and every God not just one God in a single temple but every God every heart every person is going to bow before him we are go everybody is going to see him for who he is and it's our privilege isn't it as God's people now to rightly see him worship him honor him glorify him as that God because we know that he's worthy are there any idols that we're allowing to try to reside within our own hearts at present? Are there anything, any other people or, or passions or desires that our hearts are allowing, we, we, we allow them to bow to? Get rid of them. Deal with them. Look at them because God will not allow them to reside within us. God is the only God and we must only worship him. And secondly, we have that God is jealous god is jealous now normally jealousy is a, a characteristic that we get very uncomfortable with isn't it but jealousy in god is an entirely right thing uh, just quickly flick back to exodus uh, chapter 20 if you can exodus chapter 20 which we should know is where the lord gives the ten commandments to uh, the israelites <coughs> Exodus chapter 20, we read from verse 2. God says there, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. <clears throat> God says, I'm jealous. I am jealous for my glory. I'm not going to allow my worship, my glory, my name to be given to anyone 
or anything else. Uh, in a very uh, sort of petty uh, small way, I do remember uh, when I was back in year nine doing a science project uh, on recycling. I think I remember looking back then, I remember I had to ask some of you what you were recycling in from your own households. But uh, we had to do it uh, with two friends. We had to do it in groups of three. And I distinctly remember uh, that my two friends that I was working with did next to nothing on the project. It got to two days before the project being due and they still hadn't submitted anything for it. I, I put everything together. Uh, they didn't give me share any of their information with me. Uh, nothing happened. I ended up uh, putting it all. Uh, all, of our, all three of our names are on this presentation that we then had to do. Uh, they didn't take any part in it. Uh, the science t our science teacher gave, gives us a, a, an A for the project. He congratulates my two friends uh, for the work that they'd done. And I felt a little bit jealous. Now, why are they getting some glory for something that they haven't even really done? I mean, they might have contributed a few sentences here and there. No, but they got a bit of glory, but they didn't really deserve it. God shows to the Philistines not only that he's the only God, but that he is going to make sure that his glory is protected and seen and personally understood. Uh, we have, don't we, this really challenging account where there are, uh, where God brings about a judgment, a heavy hand on the people of the Philistines. We're told that in verse uh, 6 of chapter 5, the Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod, verse 9 again, uh, but after they moved it, that's the ark, the Lord's hand was heavy against the city, uh, verse 11, so, the, so they called together all the Philistine rulers and said, send back the ark of the of the God of Israel, let it go back to its own place or it will kill us and our people for death has filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. God decided to judge the people of Philistines and it doesn't matter what actions God takes, what the, 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 the symbolic uh, elements that we find here, the tumours or the infestation of rats that, all, that accompanied that, these were the mere signs that God chose to make his hand heavy upon them, to let them know that he was against them. And the Philistines very quickly understood that this is God working. We see that repeated again in verses 10, uh, sorry, verse 7, and again in verse 10 through to 11. They say this is God's doing. It is tied with God and his ark. It is God's power. And wherever they move the city, uh, sorry, wherever they move the ark to each city, uh, the same thing follows. God made it very clear that he was against the Philistines. See, this goes back to chapter 4. Right, when, the Philist when the Israelites thought, in order to defeat the Philistines, we need God. Well, they were right. The thing is, what they hadn't realised was that God didn't need them. God didn't need the Israelites in order to defeat uh, the Philistines. He didn't need them to win his battles. God's people are never called the defenders of God. God is rather instead, isn't he, called our defender, our shield, our rock, our hiding place, our refuge. The Israelites thought, well, if we fight the Philistines, if we win, it'll get some glory. It'll honour God. We'll do it right. No, they got it the wrong way Round, which is why when the ark was captured, uh, the, the, the statement made, isn't it, at the end of chapter 4, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. They go, that's it, God's glory is gone, it, it's over. No, it wasn't. God instead works amongst the Philistines to show his glory and his power and his control is not bound by different or set circumstances. It isn't dependent on the people that he's with. God himself possesses all of his glory for all time, wherever he is, whatever circumstance he's in. There are times when perhaps we can feel a little bit like, I guess, the Israelites. 
think, well, I want, I want to do something and I'm going to serve God. And we're going to do this and we're going to get it right. And, and we're going to have God with us and, and, and we're going to have his glory seen and shown. Or maybe we think, I want Christianity to be respected because I want God to be glorified. Or really, what are we meaning is, I want Christianity to be, to be respected, not because I want God to be glorified, but because I don't want to be made to look a fool in front of other people. That's what it was in so many times for the Israelites, perhaps it even was here in this case. We've lost, let's grab God because we don't want to lose because it's going to look really bad. But what do we see God doing? God says, no, my, my glory is tied to me. It is my actions always. The Israelites, as they grabbed that ark, effectively said to God, you've got to do this, you've got to act, you've got to beat the Philistines, because otherwise your glory is going to look worse. You're going to lose something. We might at times be tempted to feel that way as God's people, mightn't we? When we see churches being closed, we say, Lord, where, where, where's your glory? Your glory is going to be lost. If you allow that building to close, if you allow those people to stop worshipping there, you're, you're going to lose some glory. No, he isn't. Or, or Lord, if you allow these, these terrible circumstances to continue, if you allow everything to go wrong, if you allow my life to look like a complete mess and the problems to keep piling on one after another, Lord, it's not going to look good in front of everybody else. I, I, I belong with you. You, I, you. Your glory is somehow reflected in my life. Well, it is to some degree. But read to remember this. God is often actually at times glorified more when through challenges or trials or difficult situations, God's people are still kept and held by him, when they still sing and declare his praises, when they still show their love for him. That was, that's what God was working amongst the Philistines. Because if the, if, the, if the Israelites had beaten the Philistines on that day in the battle, they might have gone, well, you know, the Israelites got lucky. You know, they obviously had a better day. They perhaps had better tactics. They were better, perhaps in a better position. But for the people in Philistine, they could not deny God's power and greatness at all. And neither could the Israelites. Now, as trickles of this come back into the land of Israel, what are they going to be thinking? What are they going to know? God's hand is on them. God didn't need us to protect him after all. And so they, the Philistines, they have had enough, haven't they? Uh, after the, in chapter 6, verse 1, we're told that after the, the ark had been in the Philistine territory for seven months, they said, that's it. The presence of this God is way too much for us. He's too great. He's too powerful. Let's get rid of him. And they come up with a plan to uh, send a, a sacrifice uh, back to God in Israel. Uh, they had this system set up where they put it on, on a cart. They didn't have any Levites, uh, so that, and they weren't Israelites, so they didn't, have to, they didn't know about the, the, the rules that God had given about carrying the ark. Uh, but they set it on a cart, verse 7. Uh, they get two cows, and they say, well, which way the cows go will determine and really put the nail in the coffin for us knowing whether this is God or not. And they put the, the calves of these two cows, pen them up, and the cows, they go straight off towards Israel. Here's the final proof. This was God's doing. God was working. And here, really what we have is a tragedy. Because we have the Philistines taking God more seriously, being more concerned about doing what is right before God than the Israelites had previously been doing in Israel. It is always a shame. It is always an embarrassment when those who don't really know God still consider and take more care about him than Christians. There's an atheist writing in one of the papers a few weeks ago who was saying, I just wish that the church would act like a church. Stop trying to be a social club. 
would really worship God and do it right. It's pretty condemning coming from someone who's an atheist. Now, I, I, I know exactly which churches he was talking about. But it's a strong challenge for us as well, isn't it? Are we serious about the glory and the honour of God? Are we, do we take God's glory and are we jealous for it in that we want to make sure that God's glory is seen? God says in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 11, My glory I will not give to another. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, be glory given, but to your name. The Philistines said, this God is a true God. He's a living God. We cannot contend with him because he is so great and so powerful. Do we have uh, the right view and understanding of our God do we do we guard and seek his glory not our name not our worth not our reputation uh, but his and his alone and then thirdly we see that God is holy as the ark comes back into the land of Israel uh, the people of Beth Shemesh they they look up uh, in their valley as they're gathering wheat. We're told that in chapter 6, verse 13, and they see the ark, uh, and they rejoice at the sight. Uh, we can imagine, can't we? Just how delighted they must have been to see the sent sea, uh, this ark, making its way back into the land of Israel. What is fascinating is that there has been no guard or watch set, obviously, by the people of Israel along the border. Uh, they're not, they, we're not told that these are people who are waiting expectantly for the ark to come back. Neither do we ever read of the Israelites sending armies to go and recapture the ark. I think in many ways, that again, that just reiterates the sense of loss and sorrow, the personal sense of guilt uh, that the people of Israel had felt at the departure of the ark from their land. But, but rightly, the immediate response of these people as they see uh, and have a sense of God's presence being back amongst them is to worship. Verse 14, uh, the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and there it stopped beside a large rock. Uh, the people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering uh, to the Lord. Uh, one of the commentators says they got the sacrifice wrong. It should have been two bulls. Uh, I disagree. Uh, it could be uh, two uh, female cows. Uh, we read in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 3, verse 1, the rules there for a peace offering to the Lord. And the Lord says in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 1, that it could be uh, a peace offering can be either a male or a female animal from the herd, or it could be from a male or female animal from the flock, or it could be a male or female goat. So, so they don't do anything wrong here, but they immediately offer a peace offering to God. More than that, we know that they worship God, they offer all kinds of other uh, sacrifices too. This is uh, a moment of rejoicing and excitement and restoring of the people of God. They even get some Levites in, don't they? Verse 15, uh, the Levites took down the Ark of the Lord together with the chest. And we're told that on that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. Everything looks like they're doing it right. They've remembered who God is. They're, they're, they're seeking to appease him and make peace with him and, and, and order and structure themselves correctly. And then it goes wrong, doesn't it? Verse 19. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? See, the ark, when it wasn't in the tabernacle, was covered by a veil. That veil, the Philistines had obviously still kept there. But some of these people, in their excitement of being near to God again, this excitement of being in the presence of God, they say, well, 
Let's let's lift it up. Let's check. Is it really underneath? Is this really our God? Let's let's look on this thing that's so often so shut away and, and kept far from us. And in doing so, uh, they disobey God. God gave all kinds of warnings. He gave warnings even to the priests that they shouldn't even look at it unless they were allowed to. And you can read about that in Numbers chapter 4. And the people say, who can stand in the presence of the Lord? Now, they've just got a sense of God being back with them and they go, well, we, we can't stand having God here. This is almost impossible. The burden of having a God who is holy, a God who, who does not tolerate anybody doing anything wrong, it's too much for us to bear. We, we can't have him here with us. And so they do exactly what the Philistines do, don't they? They send messengers, verse 21, to the people of kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your town. The people of God should be so delighted that God was back with them that they should have said, No, we're going to keep it here. We're going to delight in the presence of God. We're going to, to, to consecrate this land and set it apart for him. Instead, they say, Well, uh, can God go somewhere else, please? His presence, his intensity, his purity is too great for us. We do have to ask ourselves at times a question. Do we and can we ever be guilty of being so excited, of so wanting to enjoy God, that we actually display an irreverence to him? That we actually bring a dishonour to him, that we become too light and flippant, or perhaps even we could use the phrase becoming too familiar with God, that we don't take God's presence seriously enough. Yes, the worship of God is supposed to be joyful. We're supposed to delight in it. It's supposed to be exciting to us. It is something that is supposed to, to thrill our hearts. But we're supposed to remember that he is a holy God. That there is set ways we approach him. And how is that? Well, we know, don't we? Well, we approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The people of Beth Shemesh said, well, the presence of God is, is just too great for us. It, it, we can't stand here because we know that we're not worthy. Well, actually, for us today... Uh, there are times, aren't there, where we feel the same thing. You know, we, we, we're conscious of the holiness and of the greatness of God, and we say, how can I be with God? Well, Paul, doesn't he, gives us the answer. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. He says, once you were far off, but now you've been brought near. Chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse 13, Paul says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The people of Beth Shemesh said, Who can stand before a holy God? Well, the answer is, we can. Because of Jesus. That's why Peter, doesn't he, says in 1 Peter chapter 9, he says, You are a, what? Holy nation. A royal priest. The Philistines, the Israelites, what do they come to see? Well, they recognise there is only one God and every God has to bow. God will protect and watch over his name, his honour and his glory. God is holy and only allows people to approach him in the right way. Well, aren't those the things that we've learned and that we know and how do we see them perfectly displayed? In the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us make sure, therefore, that as God's people this week, we recognise God as our God. We make sure that the idols of our hearts, that they topple, that they don't stand before him. That we're careful to guard God's glory and that we approach God, remembering that we come to him only through our God and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ.